Welcome to the first presentation of our new program series, Fourth Friday at the Georgia Archives. I'm Kayla Barrett, Deputy Director, and our co-presenter today is Allison Hudgens, Reference Services Manager. This program series will feature a presentation from Georgia Archives staff and will be held on the fourth Friday of every other month. Today's presentation is New Research Tools at the Georgia Archives. This presentation will be added to our YouTube channel. Some of you may have been, can you see the screen? Some of you may have wondered what the archive staff has been doing for the past year while the reference library was closed to the public. Well, we had three major reference services software projects that had to be completed regardless of our open status. So we were able to make use of the time to work on these projects with, which included data migration and testing and staff training, and we were able to complete them much more quickly and with much less stress and disruption than if we were open. Probably our biggest project was to move our finding aids database to new software. This is the database that uh, used to search for original state agency records. Can you see? Do I need it? OK. Now you may ask why we needed to change from this software. Well, it's because it hasn't been updated since 2012 and the programmers are no longer providing any support for this product. It's what we term out of support. So we we have needed to move from the software since we moved to the university system in 2013 and it's taken some time because of other software project projects to concentrate on this. What we chose was a, a product called Archive Space. Where is it? This product, Archive Space, is a software product that's used by many archives around the country for managing their archival collections and also for their uh, public user interface, their database for their collections. Um, because it's so widely used, this is the product that we chose now. And it behaves, uh, it, it, it's organized a little bit differently from the old finding aids database and the searching is a little bit different from uh, finding aids in archive space. So we're going to go over this today and uh, show you the interface and how to navigate around it and how to conduct searches. Uh, now you will see here that we are calling it maintaining the name finding aids at Georgia archives and on the main page here, we see uh, advice about search behaviors, how the search engine is going to handle the terms that you put in. Most of our users, most of you search by keyword uh, to find what you're looking for. And again, it works a little bit differently. So I'm going to show you an example. If you were interested, for example, in what we have on Crawford County, probate records. You'll see here that we have 5,593 results. Now that sounds like a lot of, of uh, probate records for Crawford County. So what does this mean? If you look over here at filter results, you see that there are additional filters called by type archival record and collection. And these are terms that archive space uses and it will help to understand what that refers to. A collection is a description of a collection or in this case a record series that uh, describes records that were created for a specific purpose by a specific agency. And uh, it will also, this collection records will describe what you can find overall uh, in the series. 
An archival record, as we use it, is an object. It's a thing, it's a box or a folder or a volume. So looking at this, you see that there are two collections regarding probate, Crawford County probate records and uh, 5,591 boxes, folders, volumes. I'm going to click here to filter to just the probate record, the collection records, and you'll see that there are two entries here for miscellaneous records of the court and marriage records of the inferior court. Well, why does this include marriage records when you're looking for probate? Because the probate court in Georgia counties manages marriage records. So you'll find both probate records and marriage records under the probate court. I'm going to look here at the series record for the miscellaneous records of the inferior court, and you'll see here a scope and content note that describes what you'll find in these records. Most of them are estate records, wills, annual returns, inventories, and appraisements, but there are also estrays, uh, orders about stray animals, and also oaths from notary publics and justices of peace and county commissioners who are county officers, and those oaths are recorded in the probate court. The date span for this series is 1822 to 1900. There are no restrictions uh, on this series, and most of the records that you'll find in the state database have, uh, are unrestricted, nearly all of them. We have 14.5 cubic feet of records, Crawford County probate records. You'll see here is a link to expand all, and this is important. Please don't ignore this because you will find notes about arrangement and description. Um, for some series, but not for all. And in this case, uh, it, it will explains to you that the records are arranged alphabetically by the surname of the deceased, but the estrays are filed by the first surname of the freeholder and or oaths are filed by the surname of the person taking the oath. We have the record group here, the creator, that's the agency that created the, count, the, the records, in this case, Crawford County. And down here, we have under external documents, other URL. Now we can't change because of the software, the wording for other URL, and I kind of wish we could because it will take you to the old finding aid. This is the old typewritten finding aid that has been scanned and, and saved as a PDF and then attached to this record. Now some series records don't contain a scope and content note. Uh, but, but we do have the inventories linked to them. So this other URL is very important. Over here to the right, under collection organization, this is actually a list of the boxes that are available here, or the volumes, depending on what it is. But you'll see that it has here the date and then also the alphabetical span of these records. If I was to click on this, this is an archival record for a box. If you request, if you're going to submit a request for us to pull specific records, this is what we need, the identifier. In this case, this RCV. You'll also notice here that the scope and contents and dates for the box record simply repeats what's in the series record. So this is not specific to the box. It's just included um, within the box record. And that can be a bit misleading if, if you don't understand how this is working. So I did want to point this out to you that this is merely repeating information from the series record and it's not specific to the box or the volume or whatever. Up here you have bread, breadcrumbs, which can lead you back to the series record. If I say I want the file for Dora Cossie, here is the file number for this. If you give us this, we can find this, and this is the, the record that we're going to pull. So we can use either or both of them. And here again are the breadcrumbs so that we can go back to the box record and then back to the series record. There are also some links here, the collection overview, and that's what we are on here within the series record. The collection organization, if you click on that, you just get a long list of the files that are over here. 
in nice big fonts, but it really doesn't tell you anything about it. They are linked so that you can pull that up and get the box and identifier. But for most large collections, this is going to be a little confusing and tedious to go through. And this might be a better option for you to explore if you're looking for specific records. Now, most, I should also point out that if you get down in the weeds here somewhere and you need to get back out and you're not sure you want to get back to the main page, you can always click on home. Clicking on home will take you back to the main page and will get you out of wherever you are. And then you can execute another search and start over again. Now, most genealogists, many of them, like to search for names. They're looking for names, and you can certainly do that in finding aids. And, and that can be a good place to start. If I search Nathaniel Durkee, you see that there are four records here. There are no links here to a collection record because these are all items. They're all folders, the C record here. Uh, this tells you here, you have the scope and content note for the series record, but this is found in, this particular is a head right, uh, land grant record, head right and, and bounty document uh, in the box that has from Durant's East to, East, Steve, to Durant, John Durant's to Stephen East. There's also a Franklin County Superior Court case file here, miscellaneous Superior Court records, another head right record, but it's for Jackson, Robert Jackson, and uh, it, it's Nathaniel Durkee is a cross reference. And here we have a Oglethorpe County civil and criminal case files where Nathaniel Durkee is involved in a lawsuit. If I click on, say you want to look at the head right and bounty document, uh, you'll see here that we do say that these are available for free on FamilySearch.org. The collection's been scanned and it's available there. And if you look on, actually you need the series record here, and you expand all, there are physical access requirements for this series to use the online collection, head right and bounty land records and family searches in the name of it, and that you'll have to create a free online registration to view the records. Now, unfortunately, there's no way to return, return to your search results without hitting the back button. I hope that one day that will be an enhancement, but if you need to go back to your search results, you'll need to use the back button. If I'm looking at these Oglethorpe County case files here, um, here you can see the scope and content note for that series. And again, this is the box and the folder number that we will need in order to pull the records. I'm going to search now um, for other types of records and try to show you some of the quirks with uh, searching in finding aids uh, and how to work around them or to work with them, I should say. Say I want the election records for the 2016 election, the general election. So I'll put in those keywords, get the date right, and search. And here I have 2,571 records, and that seems to be a little much for the 2016 election. There are three series or collection records, but then that leaves us with 2,568. Uh, items. If I scroll down here and look, I'm getting dates other than 2016. So why is that happening? If I click here on this 20, 2006 box, you'll see here that the date uh, for this series is 1822 to 2016. And that is where that 2016 retrieval is coming from because that keyword search is, is searching everything in the scope and content note and the dates to retrieve those records and not just specifically the 2016 election. So that's something to remember that if you get strange results, look at the scope and content note and the dates and see if you can figure out why you're getting something other than what you're looking for. So I'm gonna try this again. This time though, I'm going to change 
to search by title and see if that makes a difference. And it does because it's only retrieving the, the archival records, the objects that have 2016 as part of the title. So there are the 10, the 11 folders or boxes um, for the 2016 election. We have some runoffs for specific offices and uh, then also the certified returns here. So if I was interested, say, in uh, Bartow County, uh, it should be in this particular box. Another quirk here, Fulton Tax Digests, and, and this happens with many databases and search engines that you put in the keywords and, uh, okay, so this is all of the tax digests for Fulton County, 449, and these are all, it's not a collection, these are all items, uh, boxes or, or in this case volumes or folders, we have, we have both. Um, now say I want out of all of this, I decide I want uh, 18, 1950, but I don't want to have to go through nine screens and these display 50 records at a time. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. And but, I, but really what I'm looking for is 1950. So be specific with your search. Fulton Tax Digest 1950. And that gives me the 10 volumes of 1950 tax digest for Fulton, and that's what I need uh, for to pull a specific type of tax digest, and we're going to need this identifier to pull it. Okay, now the keyword search, you will need to play with it, and uh, some things will work and some things won't. It's very important if you do a search to look and you're not understanding what you're getting, is to look at the description, the scope and content notes, and the words in the title field and see if you can figure out either why that's been retrieved or why the records you're looking for have not been retrieved and what other words could you use to search. A couple of other features, uh, especially for those of you who are used, familiar with our record group, subgroup series uh, classification system and have used those and are familiar with them, there are a couple of ways to browse for records. If you click here on collections, you will get uh, all of the series, 3,319 3, that we have. These are arranged in alphabetical order and you'll see there's 67 screens to go through. So if you're interested, say, in Surveyor General, you don't want to go through all of that. We do have additional filters here for the creators or the agencies that created those records. And now these are, are arranged by the number of series under there from most to least. And we've asked and we can't change that to alphabetical, unfortunately. So you need to scroll through this to find the agency. But uh, here, let's see, I just had it here. Surveyor General, there are 53 series. It's a good way of yeah, we're going to do that by uh, title. It's a good way of familiarizing yourself on all of the series that are available for Surveyor General. And if I look here, I want uh, lottery records. I'm going to scroll down here to lottery records. And, and what I want are the land lottery records. Now, these are the documents such as, other than the grant and the plat, such as the affidavits, certificates, correspondence, powers of attorney, and anything else relating to the ownership or transfer of land lots or fractions for uh, lottery records. There are 11.25 cubic feet. These are arranged, note the arrangement here. They're arranged alphabetically by county, then numerically by section for Cherokee only of the district or land lot number. So there's no name access to these because we don't, not all of the records for these have survived. This is, this is what we have available. If you expand your list over here, you can see the, the counties that are included in each record, each object. If I'm uh, interested in early county, for example, uh, or Fayette, this is the doc box that you will need. 
Now, we don't have the listings of the lots and districts that are available in each box, so we'll have to check, but this is what we need to check to find out if there are any records for that particular land lot. Okay. If you browse by record groups, you will have in identifier or series number order all of the top level 2001 record groups, uh, 201, I'm sorry, uh, record groups for state agency records. So you can click on this and over here there are all the subseries that are listed. And uh, you do have to drill down in there to get all 30 uh, series that are under the executive department, which includes the executive department minutes, um, messages to the General Assembly, administrative records of the office, uh, reference files, uh, speech transcripts, and of course the all important governor subject files, which are basically the incoming correspondence to the governors. If you click on that, you see that we have 1,815 cubic feet for that. So if you're interested in a specific governor, it might be a better idea to do a keyword search on the governor's name to see what's available. One of the things that we really like we archivists really like about this system is that we can do a couple of searches that we could not do in the other database. We can do a keyword search if we know the record group, subgroup, and series. Go directly to that. And that's included in everything, but the collection record is right there for the land lottery records, which we just looked at. We can also do a search for a specific record, object or box. I want those land lottery records. I know that this is it. And if you submit a request to us for a specific box and we're, we don't, this is the database that we have available. We're not sure what it is. We want to check it out. We can just type in the number that you sent us. I'm going to search by identifier for this. And that didn't work because it's the other way around. Sorry about that. Uh, still going to have to be keyword. Where did my mouse go? <laughs> okay. Can you click on search? Will that work? or not. And there is our uh, the Surveyor General records for land lottery. Hmm? There we go. OK. <clears throat> now, as you know, probably know, we are reopening the reference library and the microfilm library by appointment. Uh, we have a limited number of appointments available each day for uh, so that we can maintain social distancing and we are asking you to identify the books or the records that you and, and if possible the microfilm that you want to look at so that we can pull it in advance for you and that way you're not having to wait for us to retrieve records or pull uh, books and you can make the best use of your appointment time so you're already uh, ready to go but we know some people have prob uh, are not sure how to identify what they want. So finding aids is uh, the way to identify the, the agency records that you want to look at. The, is this still? Yeah. Can you use the? Use what? I need to change. You can use our online catalog. Okay. 
Sorry about this. We're having some technical difficulties. We, you can use our online catalog, Gill, and there's a button to that on the main page. And you can search for books and give us the title and the call number of, the, of what you're looking for. And then you can also, what we'll ask you to do is submit your request through Ask an Archivist. And this is the, one of the other big projects that we worked on. We had to change, uh, move to a different software platform for this. Uh, this service was sold to another company that uses different software. So uh, we had to activate this. Now the form that you're looking, you're going to submit your question in looks very, very similar to the former uh, Ask an Archivist form. Once you submit this, you will get an email uh, with a response. The question actually goes into a, a database that all of the reference archivists can search. They can see the question, they can see your answer or our answer. They can add notes if they have any ideas about where to look to answer your question or if they spoke to you on the phone before you submitted your request. Um, the, it, the system also gives us much better statistics for, for how we can track um, all of the interactions that we have with patrons and we know when we are busiest, when most of the, the bulk of the questions come in. Um, we can also, because it goes to an email to you, if you respond to us, you can add attachments to your email and it will come into the Ask an Archivist system. If you are trying to find an, a better image, if you have uh, or you need a citation, you can send us a, a, an image of the record that you have that you need help identifying or if you need a better copy. Uh, and we can also send files to you. And that's how we have been handling our copy services uh, during while we've been, the reference library has been closed to the public. And um, we can send a, a limited amount through that so that you don't have to mess with Dropbox. So this is another project that we've been working on and um, bringing that up and it's, it's really helped us here during the pandemic and it will help you as well. Uh, and now Allison is going to talk about our third project, which is a new patron registration system. But we're going to change batteries in the mouse first, sorry. Here, can you do this? All right, we are in business. Allison, here. Um, I'm going to tell everybody about um, our third project, which is a new patron registration system. The old patron registration system that uh, we were using was on an old server that we needed to get off of. Um, so we looked around and found a product called Aon that is um, going to be used for tracking patron registration. Um, record requests and also copy orders. I'm going to tell you all a little bit about that and what the new system means for um, uh, researchers. Forward. My slideshow is not going forward. Can you all advance the slideshow? So uh, next time you come to the Georgia Archives on site, make sure to bring a government issued photo ID. What we're going to do is we're going to check your information in the system, make sure it's up to date. If there's anything that we need to update, we will do that. 
uh, and then we will um, clear you in our system, basically make you active. Um, if anything, uh, if, if you do have a card that expired uh, after 19, or 2015, you are already in the system. We're just going to check and make sure your stuff is up, still up to date and then clear you. Um, you won't need to register again. If your card expired before January 1st, 2015, you will need to re-register. Um, but uh, registering is not a long lengthy process. Um, we will go over how that happens. Um, so you can go to the next one. Okay. All right, so um, one of the changes, oops, went back, go forward again. Thank you. Okay, so one of the, um, one of the things that we'll be changing is that when you come in to do research, um, you're going to present your blue card to the staff at the welcome desk. They are going to check you into the search room when you come to do research. Now, you won't be doing this when you come to a program or just to a lunch and learn. It's only when you're going back to the reference room to do research. So you'll tell the folks at the welcome desk that you're going to do that. They will check you in. If while you are in the search room, you request original records and you go back to, into the original documents reading area, staff will also check you into that room. When you are ready to leave for the day, you will check out with the ref with the welcome desk and um, they'll sign you out for the day. Now you still will sign that paper log when you come in at the front. That is an emergency uh, procedure. If we've got a power failure or some other kind of emergency, we can grab that and make sure that everybody is out of the building. Go forward. Okay. Okay, so some of the benefits of the new system, it's going to provide additional security for our records. Um, it will also provide a record of the things that you looked at and the records that you got copy orders of. So if you, you know, come back and need to know what it is that you pulled, what you looked at, what you got copies of, we can get to that information very quickly and provide you with those citations. Um, the system is also going to give us a better count of visitors, and it's also going to give us better statistics about research use. We were always sort of guessing, you know, this percentage of people were doing genealogy, this percentage were doing legal research. Well, now we'll have real data to back that up. And same for busy times and, um, and dates. You know, we always thought, well, Fridays feel kind of busy, but now we'll actually have real data for that. Okay, so when you are a new researcher and you are coming in to register, what you're going to do is you're going to come to the welcome desk. You're going to show a government issued photo ID to the staff there at the desk and you're going to complete a web registration form. When you're finished with that form, the system is going to assign you an ID card number. You're going to tell that number to the staff. They're going to write you up a blue card that's going to expire in five years and that's basically it. So we have computer stations set up there at the welcome desk where you're going to fill out that web registration form. When you come in, this is the screen that you're going to see. You're going to click on the first time users button down there at the bottom. Then you're going to go to a screen where there are procedures and rules for using the reference room, the original documents room. You can read through that. We do still have paper copies available if you need that. And then when you get to the end of that, there's going to be a little checkbox that you check and then you can click on create new account. Oops. This is what the registration form looks like. It's pretty similar to our paper form. It's going to ask some sort of basic contact information. Um, it is also going to ask you to provide a researcher category and then what, you, um, what your research purpose is or expected product of research. Um, and there's a little drop down to give you some options. There's also a little checkbox on there if you want to be notified of workshops and programs at the archives and you want to be added to that email distribution list, all you have to do is just click that little checkbox. And then you're going to create a password. Now the password is not something that you're going to have to remember, it's just a requirement of the system, just like you have to have a researcher card number. Once you're done with that, you're going to click submit information. And it's going to take you to a page that looks like this. 
and it's going to give you your patron ID number. That's the number that you're going to tell to the staff there at the welcome desk. They're going to put that on your card. That is pretty much it as far as registration and uh, using the new patron registration system. So um, we've got a little bit of time for questions, looks like. What is the difference between a record group, a subgroup, and a series? You want to talk about that? That's a good question. There all this here. And Alex is going to help here. I just want the camera on. Yeah. You see me? OK, uh, a, a, there are three levels to the classification. A record group is the agency. A subgroup is usually a subdivision of that agency, and, but sometimes it is a, a type of record. And then the series record is the type of records that are created and which are permanent uh, for that sub agency and for that for that agency. Um, that's pretty much it. So, so there are three portions to that, the record group, the agency, the subgroup, a sub agency or a sub uh, large portion of records. And then the series record is the type of records such as annual reports, correspondence, uh, probate records, deed records uh, that are particular to that subgroup in that agency. How does this way of researching benefit the researcher rather than the author? I don't, I don't know that that it there is so much of a benefit. Uh, I do think the layout, the graphics are are better than in the old system. You have larger fonts, uh, but the bottom line is that uh, that software is no longer being used, and we had to move from the software to another product. If um, someone needs help registering, is there somebody there to help them? There is. There is always going to be staff that will be at the welcome desk. They will help guide you through the registration process. If you ever have questions while you're filling out that web registration form, they will be right there. You can turn the monitors around. You know, there, there will be a dialogue and there will be somebody there that can help you. Don't have any other questions right now. So we'll, we'll wait a minute or two to see if any more questions come in. Okay, well, thank you for joining us for our first edition of Fourth Friday at the Archives. Our next Fourth Friday program will be Friday, May 8th, in two months. At May 8th, that's wrong. It's the, the last Friday in May. Sorry about that, just a moment. May 28th, I left a two off of that. I'll find out. So it's going to be Friday, May 28th, and the topic will be preservation. Please watch our website for more details. Thank you.